and listen, I slurp my tea at you. <sighs> Sounds delicious. Adam, if industrial design were a fitness center, you'd be at a 300-pound, sweat-drenched bodybuilder's exploding pectorals. <laughs> <laughs> that is inappropriate and disgusting. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast. For engineers, designers, and people who consider 3D printing a sport. Uh, my name is Adam, industrial designer of cadjunkie.com. Yeah, and my name is Josh, mechanical engineer of SolidSmack.com. As you are well aware by now, each week's show whip cracks your ear holes in three halves. This week, we're looking at new business models for do-it-yourself 3D printing. We'll start with the top product design stories from this week's news, courtesy of SolidSmack.com. Followed by design tips, tricks, and Q&A compliments of CadJunkie.com. Yep, and in the third half, we'll talk with special guests Alex Newman and Evan Malone of NextFab Studio, where the gym membership business model meets the 3D digital makerspace. Welcome, Alex and Evan. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show today. If the two of you were Rocky and Bullwinkle, which one of you would be Rocky the Flying Squirrel? I just got to know that. Uh, I think we both said we would be Rocky, but um, oh. my answer was <laughs> uh, being the boss here, I run around sticking my nose into everything. I thought Rocky was kind of a busybody. <laughs> okay, guys, stay put. We'll uh, be hearing more from you as the show goes on. Josh Mings of SolidSmack.com. Uh-huh. Tenderize the flank stakes of ignorance with the meat hammer of knowledge, if you would, please. <laughs> What have you got for us this week? <laughs> All right. This week's Salismatic Update is brought to you, brought by... you by the EVD Necklace Design Competition. Sponsored by Shapeways. Here's what you got to do. Design a necklace in 3D and upload the models to shapeways.com with the tag EVD. The winner chosen by our panel of judges, including jewelry designer Anthony Tamaro, will have his or her design printed on Shapeways for free up to $200. Seriously, folks, this is so dank and I really wish... But I could compete because I want me a free necklace. So jump on that, people. Enjoy the idea of printing objects in the material of your choice. Well, you've probably heard of printing chocolate, mashed potatoes, and mm-hmm. even skin mm-hmm. cells. But now, yes, this uh, cool new way of printing is part of a research project at McGill University. The prints are created by a water, a methyl ester depositing robot, building the piece layer by icy layer. It currently takes about 132 hours to build <laughs> an 11-inch model. <laughs> But uh, eye sculptors, your job just got a lot easier. I loves me some water methyl ester uh, depositing. Yes. What do you do after growing an engineering community to 70,000 users mm. and 20,000 3D CAD models? What do you do? You snag a massive $4 million in Series A funding <sighs> to add to the 1.1 million seed round you already had. Wow. That's what uh, GrabCAD engineering and design community did uh, to kick off the new year with plans to grow the bustling model sharing site to the largest (laughs) online engineering community in the known universe. (laughs) Excellent. And how is a GrabCAD being used? Well, if you're a fan of Portal or Portal 2, the teleporting escape game from Steam, you could grab some Portal models off the site and recreate them. Nice. Logan, uh, Logan Sion and Stefan Hess are a couple of Portal jumping fiends and did just that reverse engineering the handheld portal device uh, using everything from CNC and vacuum forming to glow sticks to make it happen. Very cool, guys. Uh, But I'm kind of doubting it works. I hope it does. (laughs) That would be good. Uh, Now, if you're interested in having your very own desktop 3D printer, you will be very happy to know the PrintBot Kickstarter project is fully funded, people. They had a goal of $25,000, met that, (laughs) then proceeded to achieve $830,000 in total. No now way. the project will bring full 3D printing kit to you for just under 500 bucks, first of its wow. kind at that price, and first Josh will print out the first replica of himself. Yeah, that's, that's a lot true. of firsts. <laughs> Very cool. So Alex and Evan of NextFab Studio, when are you buying your first ice printer? Well, uh, ironically, the McGill project you mentioned is something that I, I made the uh, original equipment for. It's a uh, Fab at Home machine was what they based their ice printing project on. No kidding. And I'm, oh, one, of wow. the, I'm one of the creators of Fab at Home. That, I'm genuinely surprised, but I want the lis- listeners to know that we did not plan that. No question. idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm so glad to know that. So you already have world. one. <laughs> well, I, actually, I haven't tried printing ice for that. I thought it was a cool idea. I didn't realize it took so long, though, 130. Two hours is pretty. Yeah. Well. <laughs> You'd think half of it would melt by the time the rest of it's done printing. <laughs> I think they stick the whole machine in a freezer or something. Yeah. yeah. What would you print with it? Uh, with an ice printer? Yeah. 
I guess uh, shot glasses or something like that for you know vodka that kind of shot ice beers. cubes. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know if the methyl ester tastes very good. <laughs> I'm going to spend 113 hours or whatever printing a 3D ice cube. Yeah. I like <laughs> this is this is brilliant, guys. This is the future. It is the future. The future is now, my friend. Oh, hey, Adam, 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 yep. Adam. What? Your, oh, your hair is it's on fire. Oh, I uh, will be right back. Adam O'Hearn of CatJunkie.com. Massage our sponge cake brains with the chocolate icing of knowledge, will you? What have you got for us this week? As you know, this week's Cat Junkie Q&A is brought to you by the EVD Necklace Design Competition sponsored by Shapeways. Get those necklace designs up at Shapeways.com with the tag EVD. We're going to pick a winner and print the winning design up to $200 for free. Seriously, folks, please do this. It is going to be a blast, and uh, I cannot wait to see what you guys submit. Today we're chatting with Alex Newman and Evan Malone of NextFab Studio, who use the gym membership business model for their digital fab facilities in Philadelphia. So gentlemen, in the third half, we're going to be talking about the grand vision for NextFab, the inspiration, where you guys see it going in the long run, all that kind of stuff. But Mm -hmm. first I wanted to get down in the trenches for a minute and just talk about what it's like from a technical standpoint to manage a model shop that's effectively geared toward consumers. Mm. This technology is getting better all the time, but let's face it, it's not that easy to learn this stuff. What makes you think that the general public is ready for it? Well, um, it seems to be a lot of excitement in the general public around things like uh, personal 3D printing, you know, personal fabrication, mm. Ponico, all those other sort of uh, have it made for you, but you design it kind of customization businesses. Mm-hmm. So I think... Uh, there's a there's just a, a big movement afoot to uh, to empower the customer to be involved in product development, and I think this is a little bit result of uh, we're losing a lot of manufacturing jobs here, and so there's like a pent up frustration with people who want to have mm. jobs in manufacturing but not ready to move to China for that. Well, so what kinds of data do you end up dealing with most frequently? What are people using? Um, I think that varies a lot. Um, you know, our our typical customer varies from a very art-oriented person to a sort of industrial science-oriented person to just someone who's interested in cool stuff. Mm -hmm. So we get everything from napkin sketches to maybe a clay model or, you know, a piece of cardboard they've cut up and folded. So it's, it's really anything and everything. Oh, that's really interesting. So you guys will actually help them take their napkin sketch and and turn it into a digital model that can be printed. Definitely. Um, We do a lot with vectors. Um, most of our CNCs, like the laser cutter and the plasma cutter um, and the, the router, can just run off vectors. So I basically tell people, work, it, work with whatever program you're familiar, whether that's Illustrator or Rhino or SolidWorks, anything that can output a DXF. Mm. Hmm. And then on the fab side, what uh, tools are your users using? Why do you think they favor the, those tools? So the number one most popular machine is the laser engraver, laser cutter. Um, and I think it's because it's intuitive. It's it, pretty much a what you see is what you get kind of machine. Mm. Um, yeah. So and it has it works with a wide variety of materials and some of them are are pretty when you're done. You know you don't have to do too much post processing. Right. On it. So that's that's got a big appeal. Uh, it's you know so some of the other things like the CNC routers, uh, CNC machine tools, plasma cutter, and so on. It's a little more intimidating. It's a little more work to kind of get the finished product out of the machine. So that bogs people down a bit. Uh, but still, there are those pioneers who get into those tools. So what tools do you think uh, will be most important moving forward as the maker movement progresses and more and more people want to get into this? I mean, I think software is going to be a big part of it. It's kind of, I was thinking about it earlier. And when, you know, everyone had paint on their Windows machine and a lot of people had access to Photoshop or even bootleg Photoshop, people would be playing around with it, learning how to make funny images and now there's mm-hmm. funny stuff all over the internet, but kind of the next step there is going 3D. And you've got SketchUp, which is nice, but kind of limited, and Rhino, which works for a lot of people. But, you know, there's, it's kind of a lot of specialized tools. And, mm-hmm. you know, like Evan said, it takes a lot of learning to get comfortable with them. So I think what's going to push it forward is more intuitive software and having that feed directly to the machines. I think, uh, like, CAD grab is a great example because you can grab a couple of pieces. And if you could just have a tool that would let you put them together, you know, then you'd have the kind of building block approach instead of a blank slate approach, which people find so intimidating. Yep. 
the work this mm. morning. Uh, so, do you guys have any uh, good war stories? I'm I'm sure you get uh, some completely insane data to fabricate or request. What are some of the craziest challenges you've been given from a technical standpoint, and how do you manage customers that that struggle to make good data? Well, I know uh, we have quite a few examples where we'll get a request for a 3D print job uh, with something like a SketchUp model, mm. and the total value of the job, you know in our normal pricing scheme would be, you know, like under a hundred dollars. But the, the data is so bad that we would literally have to spend like eight or 10 hours of labor to fix it. So those are the things that we struggle, you know, kind of getting back to the customer and trying to educate the customer a little bit uh, and spend less than eight hours doing that so that they can send us a file that's, uh, you know, closer to being ready to print. And usually I find the best way to resolve that is to get the, the customer in for a face-to-face. -face. You can show them the machine, you can look at the file together, you know, typically describing the problem or the way the machine prints is doable over email, but it's very difficult. You have to put in screenshots and uh -huh. use a lot of descriptive language where if you're looking at the same computer screen, you can point at the problem. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so Alex, to hear you talk, it sounds like you're as much a teacher as you are, a, you know, a, a shop technician. You're, you're really educating people and treating this place as much like a classroom as a fab shop. Definitely. We run um, a lot of classes. Um, I, I teach a SolidWorks class, which I kind of started teaching a couple months after getting familiar with the program. So um, it's, it's been a learning experience, but we, we definitely, you know, we have people working on the machines and they're having trouble doing something and they come and ask you and say, well, if you fixture it this way, it'll be a little bit more secure. So we kind of teach everything from the software to the technique. Um, just whenever it comes up. And given that there are so many places where you can just sort of send a file and have it made, we feel like it's, you know, to offer something to people here that's different from what they can get online at a sort of a commoditized price, we, we really take a pride in, in educating them, uh, helping them feel like they can take part in that design process and eventually take it over for themselves. That is fantastic. Wait, wait Josh, I think, I think your chair is... Ripping? Ouch. That, that's, Ouch. That is really gross. It hurts. W what is that? It hurts. We'll, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Today, as you know, we are chatting with Alex Newman and Evan Malone of NextFab Studio, who are taking a membership approach to the Makerspace model. So getting access to top quality digital fabrication tools like 3D printing and milling machines is as easy as going to a gym. We asked them to come on because we are big believers that the maker movement is changing the way people think about the products that people like Josh and I design. Mm -hmm. So. Evan, you founded NextFab Studio. Where did the idea come from, and what was the impetus that really got you started there? Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier in the program, I was involved with the uh, Fab at Home uh, open source 3D printer uh, mm -hmm. project at Cornell. I was one of the inventors of the Fab at Home machine. And I uh, had a chance to show that, uh, like the very first prototype machine that was functional at a, the opening of a Fab Lab, an MIT Fab Lab in South Africa. So that was a, it was a pretty neat trip to go down there and show what I felt like was fairly cutting edge technology at the time. This was 2007. Uh, and the people there, you know, most of whom were coming in with very little or if any education of any kind, let alone technical education, uh, I got to see them in the fab lab get their hands dirty with, well, so to speak, with uh, laser engravers and CNC routers and so on and software. And with, you know, within half an hour, with the appropriate kind of coaxing from a, a technical supervisor, um, they were able to actually make things. And wow. you can see all sorts of potential in that model, you know, where the barrier isn't so much the understanding, the capacity of the person to understand the tool, it's just access to the tool. So I mm -hmm. felt like I really wanted to do something like that in Philadelphia, which is my adopted hometown, um, and help the, the Philadelphia of, of old when it was sort of a world-class world center for manufacturing, kind of resume its mantle become more prominent in manufacturing again and, and help the country re retain some of its manufacturing prowess. So um, could you maybe, Alex, describe for us the typical NextFab customer? We get sometimes uh, high school students coming in with their parents um, to learn software and sort of see the machines, either because their parent has an interest in it that they've kind of passed on to their kid or... Or imposed upon. <laughs> or, or the kid, you know, heard lasers and kind of dragged their parent there. Um, oh, yeah. 
I had a, a little girl actually come in to see the plasma cutter once and was just blown away by it. But um, we also get art artists, people who are, you know, they have an idea for a sculpture, but they don't quite know how to make it or, again, don't have access to the tools, so they're looking for someone to do the fabrication. Um, we're located in the Science Center, which is a breeder facility for tech startups, so we get scientists coming down from upstairs sort of with a, you know, they, they know solid work, so they bring a drawing and, or send us a file that we can cam off of, and they say, I need this part for my experiment. Can you help me make it? Yeah. Um, things like that. So it, it really runs the gamut. Um, it's, it's hard to describe the typical customer except to say maybe that they're interested in the technology. Hmm. Uh, like a, a lot of people these days, you guys have uh, got a great idea and a really impressive jump start on it. But how will you know when you succeed? Is, uh, what does success look like for NextFab? Well, I've, uh, I've always wanted to have a, a metal 3D printer, like an EOS uh, M800 or whatever <laughs> they are, or uh, an RCAM e-beam system, something like that. So I think uh -huh. when we can, we can afford one of those and we can sure share that with our members, then I'll feel like we're, we're doing pretty well. Oh, that'd Spoken be great. like a true geek. Yeah. The, the definition of success is gear. I love it. So <laughs> obviously go. the maker movement is a big, big deal right now. We really do seem to be at the precipice of a whole new era of consumers yep. expecting people to be involved in the product design process, be it through crowdsourcing of ideas, you know, funding through efforts like Kickstarter or community fab shops like yours that essentially make this really uh, high-end expensive machinery affordable to use on a small-scale basis. What do you think are the primary drivers that are causing these kind of movements in the industry? Is it just the technology, or is there something bigger going on? Well, um, I feel like there's, there's frustration in the United States in, in the sort of... Uh, this, there's probably like a certain fraction of the populace that has a gene for tinkering with things. <laughs> and there aren't that many manufacturing-related jobs right now. Uh, you know, defense industry aside, there's, you know, most of that work is going overseas. And so I, I feel like people are just wanting to, you know, they have that itch to make things. And uh, this is, uh, you know, taking form in hacker spaces and, you know, 3D printers and so on. And, then, you know, the other side of it is that the technology is getting cheaper and uh, more automated in the sense that you don't have to spend your life learning how to operate it. You can spend a couple hours learning how to operate it. Hmm. So, uh, what up and coming technologies do you think are the most exciting for you as a company, and which ones are the most exciting for your customers? Right now, you know, we have an inexpensive uh, 3D scanner here called the Next Engine, and it does a pretty good job in terms of the hardware is great, you get a good cloud of data out of it, but converting that cloud data into some kind of model that you can then modify reasonably well is incredibly painful. It's, it's just not feasible for us to offer it as a service because of the amount of labor required. Right. Or you have to invest in quite expensive software. Yeah, and the point was to, to get to the level of software uh, required to make it you know, easier and more practical, you have to spend $30,000 for a seat of something like Magix or um, uh, RapidForm, RapidWorks. Those are, um, unfortunately, it seems like a, a a hostage market there where this collusion on prices or something because it's crazy that it's that expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I think the uh, you know the open source software community if its attention could be drawn to this problem could solve it pretty quickly. I think they just there isn't that much awareness of this as a bottleneck in the capability of you know so we need to make 3D scanning of like say you scan yourself and then you can become an avatar, you know, more accurately, uh, you know, in second life or an online gaming system. Uh, that might be a you know a killer app for 3D scanning, and help get some of the model, you know, uh, model uh, data processing. There has been some good work done with the Connect, but um, I feel like there's a limit to the resolution there. So if I if I were to invest a hundred thousand dollars in NextFab tomorrow, what would you buy? Well, in that case, at 100k, I'd say we probably go to a, a big machining center. I think that's about the right price point for it. Uh, we have a pretty small CNC. A milling machine right now. So one of uh, like a, a decent, uh, large scale, like a Haas. Uh, what would you think people would do with that? What what do you, what would your users want that for? Well, I know at least uh, one of the guys here is the most sort of active with the machine tools is uh, trying to make a steam powered uh, mechanical computer. What? Uh, and he's, yeah, he's got the design. He's an electrical wow. engineer by training, and he's, he's like steampunk by personality, and is uh, 
doing most of his work right now with acrylic parts that he's machining on a CNC router, but uh, he would really rather be doing it with steel or aluminum or something like that. Steam-powered computer. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, friends, sadly, we are once again out of time. Alex and Evan, having you on the show has been even better than that time Adam dressed up like a ballerina and did pirouettes in front of those poor, poor children. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you would like to send 3D printed ballet slippers to EVD HQ, please address those to John. I'll take them and give them to Adam. <laughs> Engineer versus designer appreciates your comments. If you'd like to dropkick the show as much as we do, head over to engineerversusdesigner.com and dropkick away. And if you'd like to see us paralyzed from the nostril down, be sure to <laughs> like us, plus one us, follow us, or whatever, as social media has been correlated with sitting motion. It's true. This show is edited by Simon Martin. Our theme music is by Ross Hart. We'll see you next week. And remember, without designers, white sneakers with dress pants would be socially acceptable. <laughs> and without engineers, I give up. You're ridiculous. Sock hop. Hip hop.